Okay, here's how Miro works. See, it's amazing. What's everyone doing at David's desk? Ever since marketing started using Miro's collaborative online whiteboard, he thinks all our other teams should sign up. Why? He says Miro's making his meetings disappear. And if every team gets on it, that means even less meetings. They're using Miro for brainstorms, mind maps, customer research. So could we use Miro instead of having another hundred meetings for every round of feedback? Yep. You can comment, react to ideas, even leave a recording on the board. And what about presentations? There are Miro templates for that. How do you know so much about Miro? I've actually been using it all along. I just used a Miro board to plan the best vacation. Okay, I'm on board. See how Miro users save up to 80 hours every year by meeting less and doing more. Get on board at Miro.com with three boards free forever. That's M I R O.com. Hello, and thank you for listening to The History of World War II Podcast, Episode 269, an interview with Dr. David Stahill about his latest book, Retreat from Moscow, A New History of Germany's Winter Campaign, 1941-42. to Dr. Stahill is an expert on the Eastern Front, having written numerous books on the subject, such as Operation Barbarossa and Germany's Defeat in the East, The Battle for Moscow, Kiev 1941, Operation Typhoon, Hitler's March on Moscow, October 41, and, though not lastly, Nazi Policy on the Eastern Front, 1941. And Dr. Stahill, thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you for having me. Yes, I am so excited to have you on, all the books you've written, all the research you've done, because even though I've been reading about World War II for a very long time, I, I, after going through your latest book, Retreat from Moscow, I don't think I even to this day fully appreciated just the, the complexity, the vastness, the number of characters on the stage. Everybody's kind of, you know, in some ways focused on themselves and how can they not be. But I, I think even to this day, I don't think we have a firm grasp of all that was going on in the Eastern Front that would end up determining uh, the, the, you know, how World War II is going to play out. Oh, look, that's, I think it's a very good reading on it all. In fact, one of the questions I often get from people is, oh, you do World War II history, but hasn't that all been done? I mean, how many books on World War II are they? And I often think, look, on one level, and I, I, I'm glad that you're laughing there because I, I think those of us who are well-read in the area, on the one hand, I guess we do see why people would say that. At the same time, when you're on the inside, you realize just how many topics haven't been done. And I think that's true of most of World War II, actually. I think if we could project ourselves 200 years into the future, we would see how many things we didn't know at 2019. That's the thing to remember. There'll be all kinds of brilliant people to come who will do amazing work. So, you know, that's true of World War II. It's particularly true of uh, the Nazi-Soviet War. It's also true, actually, of Japan's war in China, perhaps even more true there. And if you look at the aggregate number of World War II losses, it's China and the Soviet Union that account for the overwhelming bulk. So we really have to say, for all that we know, there is a lot that we don't know about these parts of the Second World War. And the number of experts who really work on specifically Germany's Eastern Front is actually very small. So there is a smorgasbord of topics, and maybe one of the things I would say to your audience, given that I don't know who they are, but there may well be graduate students or people who are one day thinking maybe I'd like to study something in this area. Most people are searching around for topics that, you know, add something. What's amazing about the Eastern Front is you can be the first person in, I think, a lot of different areas to write the book on that area because there is such a poverty of research. Yeah, I'm mean, every time that someone um, either puts out a, or find or discovers a, a journal or uh, someone's diary or something like that, mm -hmm. there is another reason to put out another book. And you're right, it is fresh information. So I don't think this the uh, uh, putting out books for World War II is going to stop anytime soon, which is good for people like you and me who do find this 
fascinating. So, so if we could, I thought we would start with a uh, with a wide view, and then on the Eastern Front, and then kind of zoom in from there. So, I did want to ask: um, you've written several books about Germany's war in the East, and personally, I'm going to start a crusade to make sure they all end up on Audible. I don't know who I have to bribe or threaten, but the good news is your latest book, Retreat from Moscow, is on Audible. I, I was very excited about that. I've already pre-ordered it. But I wanted to ask, with your years of research and your travels and everyone you've talked to, what are some things that you've learned from from, from this from you devoting so much time of your life to the war in the East? Um, I guess what I would say, uh, if I put all my books into sort of a basket and said, oh, what do we learn there? And it kind of makes a nice point to riff off, given everything I was just saying about the poverty of research. It's not that there's not books, and there hasn't been books, my books have been largely concentrated on the Barbarossa era, so that first sort of five and a half months of the campaign. It's not that there's not books on that. And and to someone who's perhaps not so well read, they would say, well, there's already got Barbarossa books where you just wrote more. Um, but the reality is, is what's taking place? Where is the narrative in those books? So to perhaps make that more clear to people, if you imagine the Eastern Front is this enormous war. You know, we're talking 150 German divisions. And to give some context on that, how many divisions does Rommel actually command in North Africa? At this time, he's there in North Africa, he's got three. That's less than 50,000 men, right? Now, given that Rommel's a household name, Rommel, we know about the Desert Fox, we know about his campaigns, we talk about them, especially here in Australia, because we fought against Rommel. We had the big battle of Tobruk and all the rest of it. So in the popular mindset, that's the big German general. Yet there's 44 commanders in 1941 on the Eastern Front. That's what Rommel is. He's a core commander in 1941. Mm -hmm. And it gives you some sense of, okay, scale. And why does that matter? Because that is a phenomenal amount of paperwork. So if you're going to go and do your Barbarossa book, you have to accept that there's a phenomenal amount that you potentially could read, unlike North Africa, where you can literally read it all. And that's not so possible. So the difference is when people have written their previous histories, the and this is not a criticism, this is just this is just the fact. You can check these in their footnotes. How far down have historians typically gone? Now the first two decades post-war, those people get a great big fat pass from me, not because their histories are wonderful, but because there were no German archives. We only got them in the 1960s. Through the 60s, 70s, 80s, I have to say, well, I would be more critical. And the histories aren't that detailed because we fell on a lot of tropes. We went back to German, where we had all the German memoirs. People just, in some ways, a bit lazy. Just do those. Just write those things up. There's some published sources, OKH, the, so the high command of the Wehrmacht war diaries were published, so they're accessible. You know, Helder's diary is accessible, so we can use that. But people don't bother to go too far down. And I think what changed in terms of the Barbarossa narrative and, and, and a lot of the books that I've been doing, to come back to your question, is to say my starting point was, you know, I moved to Germany and I learned German and I'm, and I'm saying, well, I'm going to do this, but I really want to see what is in those files. So if we're going to look at, you know, imagine the Eastern Front, then the, the, there's the high command of the Wehrmacht, as I just said. Then there's the German army with their files within that Wehrmacht structure. Then there's, on the Eastern Front, multiple army groups. So there's three of these. And then you go down from the army groups to armies. And then below the armies, you've got corps, and then you've got divisions. Now, all of them have paperwork, war diaries, intelligence diaries, supply diaries. And if you go down to these various levels, you can start to, you could spend literally years in the military archive. So I basically decided I want to look at these panzer groups, the, the second and the third, which is army group centers panzer groups. And I want to start going much further down and test to what extent is the orthodox narrative reflected in these um, in these war diaries, especially if we're focused on operational concepts, like how does the Wehrmacht make decisions? How does it move? How does it fight? How does it operate? And what I, in a nutshell, started to recognize, and I would say where the value of those those books I've been writing is at, is A, there's clearly much more detail, but two, the story changes radically, and I don't think that's a, an overstatement, at those lower levels. You start to realize that the division and the core, and even at the Panzer Group level, these guys are fighting a war which they are recognizing, yes, there's a great deal of success. That's been the orthodox narrative. You know, 1941 summer, wow, Germans are doing all these amazing things, seizing land, taking 
lots of, you know, hundreds of thousands of prisoners of war. Those are the classic indicators of military success. But when you go to the, that, that level, you start to realize these things are coming at a tremendous cost. Now, the cost is not the same. We, people will say, oh, look at the Soviet losses versus the German losses. They're so much smaller. The critical question is, though, yes, but we cannot be deceived in a sense by those losses. We have to look at German success based on what are they actually trying to do? How big is the Soviet Union? How many Soviet armies are they raising? And the operational proficiency of those panzer groups means they must retain their mobility to continue driving forward, to continue the, these battles of encirclement if they're ever going to achieve the German strategic intention. And basically, that's your narrative. The German operations at the operational level are not fit to achieve their strategic goal. In other words, if they're trying to eliminate the Red Army, they are not doing that. I'll give you one quick statistic on that. Uh, mm -hmm. 5.3 million men in the Soviet army at the 22nd of June. So it's a very, very big army. German plans are in the Western areas of the Soviet Union to encircle, to destroy this army. And we know, because people have that basic view of Barbarossa in their head, I think historians have gone into writing about this with this basic narrative. Yeah, they're going to launch all these battles of encirclement and they are winning them and they are destroying the Red Army. But actually the Red Army is increasing the size because they have a 12 million man mobilization base and they raise 40 armies over the course of 1941. What does that mean in real terms? If it's 5.3 5 million on the 22nd of June, it's actually 8 million on the 31st of December. So the Germans not only not achieving their strategic goal, in many ways, they're falling behind. Now, your readers, I'm sure, are very well read in this area. Some of them might be thinking, ah, yes, but you know, they're not the same Red Army. These guys are not as well led, not as well trained. Right. And that is all completely true. In some ways, that's what we're going to hear today when we start talking about the winter campaign and why the Soviets are having such a difficult time of it. That might not also conform with what people think of the winter campaign, because isn't this all about how terrible it is for the Germans? It's actually got a lot to do with how terrible it is also for the Soviets. Um, but the key point for focusing on the summer and the autumn campaign is that we, I think, can't be deceived, and I think that is the word, by German success, because ultimately Germany has to do one thing, and we cannot, we cannot depart from that. They set the terms for what this is. It is a six to ten week campaign to end the Red Army's resistance. They need resources to fight a much longer, very different war in the West. It's going to be an area war. It's going to be a sea war. That's different production lines. They need vast amounts of resources. That's what the part that the planning for Soviet for the Soviet Union really started with. Hitler recognizing we need resources. We, we're going to need them for a years long conflict against uh, seaborne powers. And, and, and there's going to be an air war. And the implication therefore of failing in this six to ten week period to knock out the Red Army is you're still fighting your war in the West and you are now locked into a high intensity war that you don't have the production lines nor the resources to maintain. That's why in a way my first book's called Operation Barbarossa and Germany's Defeat in the East because it's saying yeah it's all about operational problems but what are the implications of all of these operational problems and and, and that basically means yeah by the end of the summer the operational edge has been so denuded, the panzer divisions have lost so much. It's not the bulk of the Red Army that's lost, but it's in these key areas. Remember, 150 German divisions, but only about 30 of them are motorized or, or panzer divisions. So once your operational edge, your, 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 your spear tip, as it will, has been blunted, it doesn't matter that the shaft is still in, in, in reasonably good form, you're not going to be able to do this Bewegungskrieg, this war of movement anymore. And I think that's the aggregate sort of some, you know, contribution of a lot of these earlier works, going further into the archives and discovering, wow, we've got a very different narrative at these levels, because these are the guys really dealing with the operational problems. And I, ju I just have to, to ask, based on what you just said, I mean, you're right, you're right. The Germans have captured hundreds of thousands of prisoners. They've advanced thousands of kilometers. Um, they, they've done some incredible things. Um, but, but the further they go, the more the theater opens up because mm -hmm. that's the way the landmass works. It just keeps going and going and going. And I, I guess just that, by like you just said, any other traditional definition, the Germans have practically all but won the war. But I guess the question is, and I don't, and I don't want to jump too far, too fast. But mm. I guess as long as Stalin doesn't give up, and he keeps, if he had to, if he had, if he keeps, if he kept backtracking and stays in the war, I mean, he just makes it easier for himself and 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 harder for the Germans. Not that he had to do that 
to to much of a degree. But the point is, yeah, I just I, I just have a hard time seeing the people in Berlin going, okay, we can do this in ten weeks, um, considering the vast amount of territory. It, it, but you, the point you the point you made in your book is they had no idea. Absolutely no idea of the second and third echelons of troops mm-hmm. that are going to be coming their way. And, of course, that's going to be a total surprise for, for them. So by the time the first frost comes, they're like, okay, we'll wait here, let things settle down, and then maybe we could do something more. But but the initial plan doesn't work. Mm-hmm. Hitler's plan of a quick thrust doesn't come off. But I think you're really right there. I mean, that's one of the things people also, um, I think, get wrong in trying to assess the Barbarossa period, and, and you made the point there, the standard for success on each side is not the same. For the Germans, it's about really winning this thing to the point where they can destroy the Red Army, access resources, and end this high intent. They're going to have to leave divisions in the East Shore, but they're thinking this as being, you know, occupation forces, and they can get back to fighting, you know, get these soldiers back into the factory so that they can be producing armaments to fight a longer war. And right. for the Soviet Union, it's not like that. The Soviet Union don't have to win this war in 1941, nor are they going to have any chance of doing that. They need to just basically hang on. And, you know, it's not to say in trying to, people sometimes say, oh, you're, ex- you're so critical, David, of the German army. I would be equally critical of the Red Army. There's a litany of you know, disastrous decisions they make. In some ways, right. part of the reason for German success in 1941 is not so. It's not simply the prowess of Panzer divisions. It's the catastrophic decisions that the Soviet High Command is making. I mean, Battle of Kiev is one of the. It's probably the quintessential big battle of 1941 for lost Soviet soldiers, and really, the the Panzer groups are enacting this, but it's all coming because. Numerous people in the Soviet high command, not least of which Zhukov, who gets fired as the chief of the army general staff, is fired because he says, we've got to pull back. And Stalin stubbornly just refuses, 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 oh, until four armies have now been encircled. Now, was that Germany's great success or is that just a catastrophic Soviet failure? Because they saw it coming over weeks and weeks and did nothing. Um, so, you know, it, it, it takes both sides. But even in context of these disastrous decisions, um, the implications are very different. The Soviet Union has a huge resource base. They have a huge country. They can always fall back. This is the story of, of Russian history as we know through past wars. That's that's clear of 1812. That's clear of 1709 when Peter the uh, when uh, Charles the Twelfth invades. You know the Soviets. Uh, uh, sorry, the Russians have the have depth and and they can use right. depth. And the other thing we have to remember here is an offensive army isn't being. Um, uh, downgraded by battle. Yes, that certainly has an uh, an effect, and that's what we typically think is happening. But actually, one of the key things here is is sheer movement degrades an army, and especially when you look at the kind of infrastructure or lack thereof that the Soviet Union has. And then you look at what kind of vehicles is the Wehrmacht operating. These are vehicles from the 1920s, 1930s. They're air filters. These, these aren't things people normally want to talk about when they want to talk about battle and commanders making decisive decisions. But air filters matter. In an army of 600,000 vehicles, you know, what are your air filters when you look at how much dust is on your average Soviet road? And when you get those air filters overwhelmed, how much of this dust is going into those engines? How do they deal with that? Well, then they start to think, well, we just flush out the dust with massive amounts of oil, then they realize we haven't got enough oil, then they say, well, the air filters are gone, but we'll just keep driving because, hey, we're going to win this thing in a short period of time. That doesn't happen. You get further and further into Russia and you're realizing you have massive fallout rates and you haven't got the production to go and get a whole bunch of new engines. And you're realizing, well, this whole thing is grinding to a halt for secondary reasons, theoretically. But these secondary reasons, uh, you know, it's just as important how many tanks have you got uh, versus how many trucks have you got, how many jeeps, how many radios. And if everything's suffering because of the advance, not to do with the Red Army necessarily, then you are, you know, uh, immobile. And that's a real problem in the depths of Russia. Right. Oh, yeah. And I can't wait to get to that because I was I was watching a YouTube video of you being interviewed and, and you can have a perfectly functioning tank as far as its turret, the shells or whatever. But if its air filter is messed up, if its engine is messed up because of the dust, it's just sitting there. So so I, I can't wait to get into that. But to take a slightly different uh, tact. So every book, almost every book I've ever written and I've been and I've been reading about World War II for quite some time, they all pretty much say the same thing. They say Hitler makes a mistake by attacking in the East at all. He had his non-aggression pact. He could do whatever he wants, you know, that kind of stuff. 
but the subtitle of your book is A New History of Germany's Winter Campaign, 41 to 42. So if I can be so bold, what's new about it as far as you're concerned? Uh, that's a good question. It's also a, a bigger answer, but I'll, I'll try and be as succinct as I can. <laughs> you know, my my starting point, I don't mean to go back to Barbarossa, but I want to just illustrate for your readers that it's the same methodology that I'm applying. So if, as I just said, we need to judge the Barbarossa campaign based on what the Germans themselves sought to achieve. In other words, they're basically, if you look at War Directive 21 in, in December of 1940, they're seeking to destroy the Red Army in the Western districts. That we've already covered. So that's my benchmark by which I judge Barbarossa. This is important because I want to apply the same methodology, but I'm going to get very different results in the winter. What does that mean? Until the winter offensive, the Soviets launched their winter offensive on the 5th of December. It really begins in earnest in the following days, but the first few attacks are registered on that 5th of December. And uh, and the Germans, until the 8th of December, when Hitler issues a new war directive, number 39, and at that point he's saying, okay, we're not trying to attack anymore. We are on the defensive. And on the defensive, uh, this war directive sets out what they're trying to do. Uh, it basically says to abandon all immediate major offensive operations uh, and go over to the defensive. And then it sets out exactly what that means. The way in which these defensive, I'm actually reading this, the way in which these offensive operations are to be carried out will be decided in accordance with the purpose which they are intended to serve. And the first point that they make under that is to hold all areas which are of great operational or economic importance to the enemy. You could equally say with that, it's not just economic and operational importance to the enemy, it's absolutely essential to the Germans. That mm -hmm. is now German strategic policy. So the question we have to ask is, how successful are the Germans in achieving that goal? It's not yet the Holt Order. The Holt Order is the famous order that Hitler issues where no one will move back at all. That hasn't been ordered yet. That's going to come in two weeks, right? So at first, there is operational freedom to move back. Now, I imagine if a lot of your authors, oh, sorry, a lot of your readers are, you know, well read in uh, the winter campaign, the one sort of overarching narrative, narrative we have of the Germans is black on black. This is chaos, disaster, retreat, it's not going well. In fact, the, the subtitles of a lot of the books, there's a book in 2006 on this and a more recent one from uh, Michael Jones, The Retreat. Uh, the subtitle of both books is Hitler's First Defeat. I think in a, in a way that that says a lot. It says it says a lot about Barbarossa. How could Barbarossa not be the failure? The Germans don't achieve what they seek to achieve. But it's interesting how the orthodoxy has that as, well, that can't have been a failure. It's the winter. And the winter is framed as the defeat. Now, Let's just unpack that. The German mm -hmm. operational, sorry, the German strategic goal, according to this war directive, is to hang on to these major population centers. Why are they so important? They have headquarters, they have radio stations, airfields, hospitals, train stations, heated barracks, warehouses, mechanical workshops. They have industrial kitchens, public baths, they have everything you need to sustain large armies over the winter. And so they're anchoring their defense on these. So this is what we have to be careful of when we start to assess German retreat. There's basically, um, I, I would say, for the histories that have been written, what's interesting, and I started to reread them as I went into this book about five years ago, I thought, okay, I'm gonna reread these histories. And what I started to realize was, the narrative that we're getting is a very black on black narrative, but they're following areas of army group center where this is true and largely ignoring other areas. So keep in mind, Army Group Center is six armies. Army Group Center is just one headquarters in Smolensk. So you're actually looking on the ground at six armies. That's about 700 kilometers of front, and none of them are having a generic war. In other words, they're not, you can't subsume any one experience to all six of them. They go in and out of crisis. None of them, they are never all in crisis. The crisis shifts between different areas of the front. So this narrative that we typically get of how terrible it is for the for Army Group Center is only true of some sections of the front at some periods. My, my way of unpacking this then, and I, it's nice to be able to share this with readers, is I really realized, okay, this is not the overall narrative. So when I get into the archives, I want to engage with what everyone's doing all the time. So I basically came up with a formula. I'm going to write my book every 10 days of the winter. And I'm going to do it at 10 days at a time, and I'm going to give equal 
time, equal number of words to each of the armies. So people don't have to remember this, but I'll quickly list north to south all the armies. Ninth Army, Third Panzer Army, Fourth Panzer Army, Fourth Army, Second Panzer Army, Second Army. And I'm going to go through 5th of December to the 15th of December in my first discussion, what's happening in all of them, because the crisis is Third Panzer Army at this point. And that's what we get in the books. And people just talk about that. And then you're left to think, wow, this is how it's happening in Army Group Center. That's actually not the case. We have two other types of narrative. So we've got this really terrible disaster. We have other areas of the front where, you guessed it, not much is happening. And then you have other areas of the front where there is an enormous amount of fighting, but you don't see a retreat. Who's attacking? The Soviets. Who's defending? The Germans. And the fact that the, the front isn't moving back, I think, I can't answer for other historians, but I think that's why they haven't concentrated because when they look at maps, they don't see any movement. But if you're really doing your homework and saying, no, I'm going to look at everything equally, then I start to look and realize, hey, in this period, the Ninth Army is doing a lot of fighting. And the reports are catastrophic But for the Soviets. They're driving into German defenses and getting annihilated. Now, that's equally important to our understanding of the winter campaign. In fact, if I was to take a whole lot of information and you know, put it into a very condensed form. Right. What did I just say? If it's in the summer campaign, uh, a Bewegungskrieg, a war of movement that the Germans are trying to win, and they fail to do that in their ten to six to ten week period, then the thing I argue in my first book is at the end of the summer, this is now clearly a war of attrition. So, if it's a war of attrition, and it's a war of attrition very much by the by the by the winter, then we have to take account of what are the relative losses. So let's ask that question. December, January, February. How many German losses do we see throughout the whole of the Eastern Front? But the overwhelming amount of fighting in this period is Army Group Center. The total for the Germans is 263,000 men lost. Casualties, right? So that's wounded, killed, missing. That's a very large figure in context of a country like Germany. They cannot afford this war. This is a problem for them. But the figures for the Soviet Union in the same period, three months, 1.6 million, that's six to one losses. So already there, I think, if this is a war of attrition, the Germans are killing a lot more Soviets than they're losing themselves. And when you first engage with the narrative here, if people, if I just said, oh, what do you think of the winter campaign? You would almost always get stories of, oh, the Germans were suffering this and they were freezing to death and they didn't have enough uniforms. And and the, the idea in our heads is they're the ones losing because, you know, again, the classic indicator of military success is the guys who are retreating, especially if the association of this retreat is a very negative one, you know, it's, it's falling apart, it's unorganized, they're losing a lot of equipment, they must be losing much more. But that's not the case. Why? Because not, not enough of the histories have taken enough account of the uh, static areas of the front where there is actually fighting and it's disastrous mm -hmm. fighting for the Soviets. So uh, so I think we've really got to focus on a holistic discussion. We've got, to, we've got to look at all of Army Group Center, and we've got to consider this not just in terms of disastrous German operations, but indeed from disastrous Soviet operations. And again, that's just the, 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 the attritional struggle. If we're looking at the strategic side of it, as I set up before, there's all of these um, population centers the Germans are trying to hold. So let's ask that question. How many of these strategic centers do the Germans hold? They lose two big cities. One's called Kalinin, that's in the very north, that's actually the Ninth Army. They try and defend it, as I say, for that first 10 days. And then at the end of that 10 days, the Germans decide, we can't do it, we're gonna pull back. The Ninth Army can't hold here. We're not gonna hold on all our flanks, we've got too much frontage, they start pulling back. Um, that's their choice. They don't get forced out of it, they give it up. But in some ways, Kalinin, for all that I just said about what the virtue of these big cities are, it was right on the front lines. It's been destroyed by constant fighting at Kalinin. So how much virtue there was in, in that city is questionable. But they also lose Kaluga, which is southwest of Moscow. The Fourth Army lose that. Now, a whole litany of other cities that are absolutely essential to anchor this German defense, they are held. Rezhev, Ninth Army's new headquarters, Vyazma, Smolensk, Bryansk, Oral, Kursk in the south. These centers are being held. So again, let's ask that question. What are the Germans trying to do? They're trying to defend in the east. And that doesn't mean defending every inch of ground. That means holding major operational and economic areas. That's why they survive. That's why it's not 1812. Those centers are super important. And if you look at some of them on the maps, as the, the book has, has maps, uh, you know, 
to illustrate these things, you can see places like Rajiv are almost 80% encircled. The 9th Army fights and fights. Why? Because they need to keep that train line open at the south and they need to defend the city. And they do defend the city. So right. if we then go to the Soviet side and say, well, what are they trying to do strategically in the winter campaign? They are seeking, first of all, it's very limited. They're just pushing back the German uh, offensive prongs just north of Moscow and much further south around Tula, east of Tula, and they're pushing them back. Uh, around Tula, they're having less success. They're certainly pushing them back, but they're not destroying parts of the, the, the second Panzer Army. It's Guderian's Panzer Army. But certainly north of Moscow, they send the Germans into a real retreat, and it's a real crisis there. So third Panzer Army is having a very hard time of it. Um, but... Ultimately, they will then develop these ideas as they have success against the Germans into far more ambitious offensive operations in the same way that the Germans always in 1941 were overshooting the mark. They set strategic objectives that their operations couldn't equal. Well, that's the story of the Soviet narrative in the winter. They decide that they're going to ultimately try two encirclements, a smaller one at Vyazma and a much larger one at Smolensk. They even in their documents speak specifically about the destruction of Army Group Center. So let's just assess that. Do they encircle either of these two groups? Do they ever get to Vyazma or Smolensk? No, they don't. Do they destroy Army Group Center? Clearly not. Do they encircle any of the six armies? No. Of all of the corps, do they ever encircle any of them? They don't. And even of the divisions, something like 70 plus divisions in Army Group Center, they do encircle a handful of them, but those divisions always manage to break out again with losses, no question, back to German lines. So at the end of the winter, we can say the Soviets never achieved their strategic goal, not even close, lose phenomenal numbers of men, but the reverse is not true of the Germans. They set strategic goals, almost exceptional in the entirety of the Second World War for Germany, which are realizable. One of the mantras of German military history in the Second World War is people say they're very good tactically, they're good operationally, or there's questions about how good operationally. They're, terribly strate they're terrible strategically. They always set goals that they can't achieve. That's actually not true of the winter. The goals they set, their operations equal. They don't lose major formations. They do hold the front. They do hold these areas of uh, economic and, and, and operational importance. They deny them to the Soviets. And so the strategic goal for the Germans is achieved. It's not for the Red Army. And conversely, if we look at it another way and say, well, what about this? the sheer losses involved? Yeah. It's six to one in favor of the Germans. So I think there's a lot here in how we understand this period and, and chart those operations through the various armies that really underlines, hey, maybe we need to take a, a very different look at how we understand operations in the East in the winter of 41, 42. Here's a question for you. What would you do to save humanity? And how far would you go to stop someone who was getting in your way? The ancient rivalry of assassins and Templars cuts to the heart of good versus evil. But it wasn't always clear who was good and who was evil. Plug in to explore the amazing world of medieval feuds. Echoes of History, Assassins versus Templars, is a special collaboration between History Hit and Ubisoft, the masterminds behind the Assassin's Creed games. Hosted by Dan Snow from History Hit and Matt Lewis from Gone Medieval, together they will take a close look at the real history of the secret societies, which inspired the Assassin's Brotherhood and the Templar Order in the Assassin's Creed games. Plus, they will bring on other premier historians as they discuss unearthing the myths of the Grail and who really was the inspiration for the main characters in the game. Echoes of History, Assassins vs. Templars podcast is available right now wherever you get your podcasts. Listen and subscribe to Echoes of History today to discover the hidden truths that have shaped our world and inspired the video game series. That's Echoes of History wherever you get your podcasts. Listen today and subscribe for more. Yeah, that was one of the things that I really enjoyed about your book is that it helped me understand the complexity. Did the Germans, you know, did they make it to Moscow? Did they invade Moscow? No, but they got pretty close. Were they pushed all the way back? No, they held their territory. Were the Soviets able to bring up a lot of more soldiers? Yes. Did they throw them at the Germans? Yes, but they lost, like you just said, 1.6 million. I mean, it's a complex, ever-flowing situation. And I did want to ask um, one thing because I know it sets up the next question. So when the Germans stop on December 5th, it's not so much... Because, because, you know, one, I guess one of the, the few things I know about tactics and strategy is that if you're fighting a larger force – 
you can destroy them one or two of ways. You can, you know, encircle them like they did at the outset of Barbarossa, you know, bust their flanks, encircle them, come in and crush them. The other thing is to set up a strong defensive line and just let them bash themselves against you. That That's that's another solid um, mm. thing as well, as long as you can pull it off. But when they give the order to stop on December 5th, is it pretty much because, hey, we need a break, we, we're, the men are exhausted? It's it's that they, they haven't lost, but they've just been worn down so much that they can't go on any further with, with the same kind of pace and speed. I just want to make sure I understand that December 5th stoppage. Absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, the encirclement, as you say, is a feature of the summer. It's even a feature of Typhoon, which begins um, at, at the start of October. By November, that's no longer the, the, the German operations. They, for all kinds of reasons, to do with the fact that they've lost motorization, but also just the, the sheer weakness of their offensive assets, they, they, yeah. they are not encircling any German, any Soviet forces. They're still pushing forward, but it's a grinding frontal attack which is trying to wear them down. And the Germans are, you know, they're a victim of their own, in some ways, propaganda. They believe because they themselves are seeing, God, we're at the end of our strength. We have no more reserves. We're throwing in the last, the, the mantra is, the last battalion will decide the issue. A lot of them, they're even citing 1914, where they think the Battle of the Marne was lost because, well, the Germans, we didn't throw in the last battalion. We sort of gave up when we were so close to breaking through. Oh. And if only they had been, uh, you know, more committed. And so they're even talking about this in their in their own uh, discussions about this, you know, uh, I think there's three or four references I came across to 19. 14 they're pushing 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 thinking we've just got to get there that last part if we can just do it even though really when you look at the map the germans are nowhere near close to encircling <laughs> moscow they have a very right. well-developed arc in the north the southern one is 200 kilometers from moscow it's coming up on the eastern side of tula guderian's never gonna make it it's kind of you do sit there and look at the files and think what are you guys, you must be seeing the same maps I am. What are you thinking? And although we talk about Army Group Center still being on the offensive until the 5th of December, that's actually not the case. By the last, by the first days of December, the number of attacking units is down to something like 10. And a lot of those are provisionally uh, attacking. So they ultimately grind to a halt. And what the Germans don't know, but really should have known, because right. the story of 1941 had been... The, the Soviets are constantly raising new armies. They raised 40 armies over the course of 1941. So every time they've cracked the front and destroyed a whole lot, they think, okay, now we've broken through into operational freedom. We can now exploit this drive east. And then they realize, oh, there's more Soviet forces coming up against them. What they don't realize in that early December period is there are multiple reserve armies that have never, ever been committed. So forget the idea of the last battalion. They don't know that these Soviet armies are there. That's what's going to constitute this massive Soviet offensive. They just have no idea they're there, which reflects how poor their intelligence is, but also the arrogance after having seen so many armies arrive on the front, which they didn't know existed, they just sort of assume, well, that they, they, they must be out of them now. And yet then they get hit and they're mass, they're you know, overextended on these, on these flanks, uh, on the flanks either side of Moscow. And this is why the retreat in some ways, um, this is another important point of context for the retreat, retreats aren't by definition bad. In both cases mm -hmm. where they're retreating in, in, in that first 10-day period, they're absolutely essential. I mean, these guys cannot hold these lines. And they themselves in their own reports say, you know, we have no protection, we have no mobility. And now that they start to see Soviet forces arriving at the front, the Soviets don't begin with everything on the first day. They themselves are getting to the front. As that pressure builds, these guys are sending their reports back saying, we have burnt out divisions, no mobility, and these guys are turning up in ever greater numbers. Uh, we need to really pull back. We need a, some sort of line to hold on here. We're in the middle of nowhere, and we're, we're, we're going to sort of stop and try and hold this. We're at the end of the very tenuous supply lines. So the, the retreats uh, are in many instances to the benefit of the German army. Remember, land is not as valuable in a place like the Soviet Union. Not every village is strategically important. Pulling back mm -hmm. helps them defend. Um, in fact, that's exactly the narrative of those bottom two armies, Second Panzer Army and Second Army. Essentially, to tell the story in a nutshell, uh, they will withdraw through December, very much actually against orders. Well, Darian, for all that he is this sort of great attacking commander, he is the great retreating commander. He didn't care. I'm pulling back. And he pulls right. all the way back to the Susa and Oka rivers. And 
you know, make a long story short, and ultimately they get there by the end of December, they have had their crises along the way, but they get there and then they hold, and they hold for the rest of the winter. And they hold so well that, uh, again, this narrative of how's it working out for the Soviets, not very well. The Germans are now on defensive lines, they've secured their oral and Kursk sort of basis of supply, and then they're very effective. So effective, in fact, it's the second Panzer Army that's facilitating offensive operations to help relieve pressure on the fourth army, their northern neighbor, who they're trying to reestablish a connection with. But it's an interesting story because, again, uh, the narrative is black on black for the Germans, and that's not what's happening in some of these armies once they get their footing. And there's the other story here that I think is really interesting and surprised me in the research process for the winter was how much offensive operations how many offensive operations the Germans were launching through the winter. They're not what we imagine them to be. They're not, we don't even see them on the map because the maps are produced at a sort of one one hundred thousand scale and right. you, you really can't see them because it, it, but what they're doing is they're basically saying, guys, what we need to do to deal with this mass of the Soviets is short, sharp punching attacks that might only drive two or three kilometers. We go around their flank, we inflict massive losses, and then we pull back, catch our breath. And that way we destroy large forces because these guys aren't prepared for it. As they move forward, they haven't got entrenched positions. They don't coordinate well because they're big as an army, but they've got no staff work. They don't bring up their artillery. They don't coordinate with anti-tank defenses. And they start to realize this. And then they say, well, the best defense is our offense. Let's drive into them, smash a thousand, two thousand, three thousand guys pull back mm -hmm. catch our breath and they're doing this with very very small numbers i mean it's sometimes 200 guys a handful of armored vehicles but they inflict massive losses and you can start to see how two things are happening here they facilitate their defense not just by holding a static line but by punchy short sharp offensives and these things are replete through the, the german archival files and you can also really see that again when you zoom out you come to that final figure of 1.6 million Soviet casualties in three months for a period that we normally think is Soviet success. How did they lose so many guys? It's not just that they're throwing themselves into machine guns, although that's probably most of it. In fact, Zhukov is ordering, sending out orders. The first one comes, I can't remember the date, I think it's the 9th of December, where he sends an order to the Western Front saying specifically, stop attacking German defensive positions. You guys have to... to Think of new ideas, and, and that's not just to blame Soviet commanders at the lower levels, but these guys are in positions where they've had no training, no idea, and they are getting orders from above saying, you will capture this by the by the 10th of December, and you will do it. And they are under enormous pressure to do it, so then they they try to do it, but they don't have the training, they don't have the doctrine, they don't have the heavy equipment, that's another huge failing for the Soviets in the winter, they can't support these operations, and they see the enemy, and then they attack it, and that's kind of the perfect solution for the Germans. The, the real solution for more sensible Soviet commanders is to not attack the strong points, but to attack the weak points, to go around flanks. But even then, then they're not well supported by trucks and infrastructure. They get a few kilometers into their event, uh, advance and the Germans are already trying to operate into their rear areas. You know, it's a complicated war, but this is the, the, the story of what's happening on the ground. And that reflects in these bigger numbers. If, if I could do a quick follow-up question, because, yeah, you mentioned in your book time and time again just that obviously the uh, the mid-level uh, Soviet soldiers aren't very experienced, they're not very trained, Hell, they haven't had time uh, to, to take any serious mm -hmm. training, and there was a, either a lack of coordination with artillery or there wasn't a lot of artillery um, I, I know that's going to change, but but refresh my memory because by this time Stalin has moved a lot of factories, maybe as far as the Urals, but are they still are they still you know like in the in the early winter are they still moving to the Urals or are they still setting them up? Definitely. Is there a lack of artillery at this point for the well, Soviets? Well, there's a lack of heavy equipment. Uh, artillery would be the one thing the Soviets have, at least relative to the Germans, in significant numbers. I mean, that is one of the, the, the figures of the Red Army. It is quite astonishing when you look at uh, comparative tables, if we can ever get exactly uh, comparable tables. 
the preponderance of Soviet artillery is really throughout the war quite striking. It's the one area where there's a big disparity. And that's also reflected in the production charts. In fact, you know, one of the, the points I often find myself making when people, um, you know, question me about this idea, well, you know, is it really so bad for the Germans? And you say it's this attritional war, but, you know, how do we understand that attritional war? It's not just about the fighting and the losses at the front. It's very much a war of, and it's not so sexy in a way for military historians, because military right. readers sometimes want to read about tanks and tell me about Guderian and where they struck in their open flanks. And actually, a story of a war like this on this scale is is it, I'm sorry to say it, but it's a little bit boring in that we have to look at economics, we have to look at finance, we have to look at raw materials, we have to look at industry, because that's what's supplying the Eastern Front. If you reduce it all to a vacuum and say, it's all just about the battle, that's fine, but you're limited in terms of understanding what are the implications of these battles, right? So the losses for the Germans are not the same as the Rus losses for the Russians, because the Russians have actually already in 1941 a larger output in key uh, weapon systems that are important to the Eastern Front, so artillery, they are outproducing the Germans in 1941. Tanks, outproducing the Germans. Aircraft, outproducing the Germans. And their equipment is good equipment, right? Um, right. And that's not to say that that's, that's, that's also, and in some ways, too simplistic because doctrine training matter. So you might have better tanks because they have T-34s coming out of their factories. They have KV-1s. These are great tanks. And they have right. larger numbers. So that tells us one thing, but actually the Soviets don't use them as well. So the Germans can still gain an operational edge. That's why they are still doing well in 1942 in terms of the Eastern Front doesn't collapse, it's the Germans on the offensive. But as the Soviets learn the lessons of their mistakes, and that's another thing I think you can say about the winter, part of the problem with that huge Soviet loss is in and of itself is so costly, but the when you have losses of that scale, the ability for the Red Army to learn lessons, like you drive, launch in an attack as a, an inexperienced commander and it goes terribly, but if you keep fighting this way, your men are lost, you yourself is a, you know, a major can be lost in these kinds of horrendously expensive operations, and then the learning curve starts again. What, the, what happens with the Red Army, and I think this is a, a, a story we need to look at over a longer period than just the winter, but as they survive more and more, and there's going to be more disasters, but over time, people start to learn from their mistakes, and there's nothing like war to, to illustrate to a human being, I need to learn fast here. And I got to, I really got to learn the lessons of this. And then they start to learn. We got to have staff work. We got to plan these things. We can't just make ideological decisions or or timetables that are made in Moscow and just applied in a rigid form at the, at the front. And as they learn those lessons, that translates into ever more effective Soviet operations. And of course, what's happening on the other side is the Germans, yes, they have uh, a real proficiency in this area, but their forces are being ground down. And that means over the course of the war, less training time less well-trained units, less of those units, and that starts to tell the story. And that's the attritional side of the Eastern Front. Right. So if we can move to, if we can go to the next phase. So this mm. knockout blow that Barbarossa was supposed to be doesn't come. So it's either time for plan B. I don't think there's one. I'll let you answer that. But is it, or is it time for a modified plan A? Which leads me to ask, you, you were talking earlier about Hitler's December halt order. Now, in the past, that's been represented as something as uh, it gave the armor group center, you know, time or space or whatever to save themselves. But you don't quite see it that way. How, how would you uh, explain or interpret Hitler's halt order? Yeah, look, a lot of the uh, a lot of the literature that talks about the halt order, um, I think, comes from. There's German generals who are after the war, and of course that's our first sort of primary evidence. And these guys are typically very critical of Hitler. You know, again and again, all the mistakes of the war are his fault. But the one exception seems to be they say, oh, but you know, the halt order, uh, that you know, that was a good thing. Um, mm -hmm. And I think a lot of historians have adopted that narrative and and sort of said, well, you know, it, the, the halt order, you know, comes into effect, and then we do see army group centers sort of holding. And there's two things about that that I think we, we have to interrogate. Really, is Army Group Center holding? Because uh, one of the, the best maps I've got in that new book is, um, it's uh, one you have to look at for a bit of a time, but it basically takes uh, different periods of the winter and it's sort of a numbering system. And the, the areas where Army Group Center retreat are in shaded areas with uh, different types of shading and there's a, a number in the boxes and they correlate to different periods. It doesn't matter what period you look at throughout the winter, there are always retreats taking place. So the first thing is the halt order is sort of held to be this, you know, there is this, you know, 
order that comes through. It's very draconian in its wording, and the German armies are now being held in place. Well, the German armies are, 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 are manoeuvring. They're manoeuvring the entire war. So you might ask the question, okay, so there was flexibility, and, and Hitler must have made exceptions. That's really one of, I think, the more impressive things about what I discovered for this book. What's going on is these guys aren't opposed to Hitler. They're not in opposition to Hitler, but their lives are on the line. And what's happening at the front is, because the only way to get a retreat now is Hitler's personal authorization. So imagine you're some major on a 700 kilometer long front, and you're looking at your local intelligence and you're realizing, this is ridiculous. We're in slip trenches, we're freezing out here, and they have got huge superiority, 10 to one, and they're going to storm into our positions. Get Hitler on the line. That's not not going to happen. At the same time, we could stand here and all die, or we actually pull back. And Hitler on his scale maps doesn't see two or three kilometers of ground being lost. And the only reason we know this is because, again, it just substantiates the virtue of more research, which is what I was saying about what do we learn about the Eastern Front from doing previous books. So if you go down to these divisional levels, you start to see them writing about things that they're not supposed to be doing, like preparing defense, make sure the roads are cleared so we can always pull back. But hang on, if there's a halt order, why are you guys discussing this? You can't leave. Mm. But then you realize there are movements at the front. They talk about doing these things and you realize, so this is not happening. And then when you start to, when you've got that in your head and you start to interrogate this further, like how far is this going? What are the army commanders saying? What are the corps commanders saying? What is von Kluger? That's the, the, the commander of army group center. What's going on here? And it, what's actually happening is there's a tremendous amount of duplicity. These guys are sometimes openly discussing the ridiculousness of this order. We must maneuver to save ourselves. It makes no sense to stand. I mean, this is what they just criticized the Soviets for five and a half months for doing. We break through on their flanks and then they don't maneuver. They just stand there and it facilitates encirclements. So let's not believe the national socialist myth of Hitler orders and everyone suddenly held. Well, if that worked, why didn't it work in 43 or 44? Just issue the hold order and everyone will hold. They can't hold and they don't hold in 1941 either. The difference is in deep snow with very poor maneuverability, the Soviets, when they break through, take a very long time to enact their encirclements. And as they're trying to do that, it gives the Germans time as they're discussing this stuff furiously internally within Army Group Center furious phone calls between various levels of command saying we need to pull back they're all saying well we're not allowed to and they're going to Kluger and Kluger's on the phone to Hitler and they're day long conversations Army Group Center's war diary is fantastic for this long long conversation he's trying to ring out some kind of exception Hitler's like no 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 and then the retreats are happening in a lot of cases anyway and how do we know this this is one of the most interesting things Kluger in one of the most important areas, the southern flank of the 4th Army, it's the 43rd Army Corps, it's been broken through on the southern flank, it's got a massive open flank, it's being encircled from the south, then they break through in the north and it's being encircled from the north. A guy named Hanritzi is in command and he is uh, about to be destroyed. That entire corps is going to be destroyed. It's quite clear to him. He's pleading for for permission to withdraw. He's on the phone to Kluger every few hours. Kluger is on the phone to Hitler. Hitler is saying, no, 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 no. And if, and I wanted to look into this, you know, so what does it say in Army Group Center's war diary about withdrawals? Nothing. What does it say in the 43rd Army Corps about withdrawals? Nothing. And yet we have the personal correspondence from Heinrichsee to his wife. What does he write in there? We're about to be destroyed. Thankfully, at the last minute, Kluger has privately given me authorization again to withdraw. So we can say at the highest levels of Army Group Center, this duplicity is taking place. And they're not writing about it in the war diaries. If we didn't have those private letters, in other words, is that an accident? Or are they saying, guys, we cannot officially be doing this, but we are doing it. So does the halt order save Army Group Center? Uh, no, Hitler is doing terrible things, trying to run an entire war with these. I mean, whoever had, whoever should be trying to, come up with blanket solutions to complex nuanced problem, uh, uh, problems. And, and Kluger gets it. Kluger is trying to chart a course throughout the winter between the Guderians who are just, I don't care, I'm withdrawing. Kluger's trying to rein him in too, saying, look, you just can't keep giving up every defensive line, even without Soviet pressure. We have to hold somewhere. And at the same time, he's trying to deal with Hitler, saying, you've got to give us some flexibility. So he's basically going to all of these army commanders and he engages very differently. I think he's the, he's the real reason army group center holds and he really gets it he's not one of those german generals that people have really looked at in great detail but again how much how many of the files have people looked at and kluger stands out as a guy who says if we can hold we must hold but if it gets to the point of you guys are going to be destroyed 
the last minute we got to do what's got to be done. And believe me, I'll even, but we got to keep this quiet. And that, once you've got that in your head and you're starting to look at all the different files, you see evidence of it time and again, both people preparing for defense, uh, for preparing for withdrawals or enacting them. And then at the same time, at the other, at the other side, there's a core commander in the Ninth Army. There's only three corps in the Ninth Army. And this core commander says, this order is, com- for Hitler's order, is completely ridiculous. I'm not observing it anymore. I'm just going to wholesale pull back. Kluger gets on the phone to him and says, are you really going to pull back? Because you don't have the authority to do it. I know how bad it is, but you've, you've got to wait to the last minute. He said, no, I'm pulling back. He said, you're fired. Get the next guy in there. And, and it just goes to show Kluger is having to work between an army that is in some ways quite rebellious. And, you know, these guys are frightened. They're, they're, they're in real mortal danger. They're trying to save their formations. But Kluger's responsible for much more than just any one corps or any one army. He's looking at the whole front and he's standing between these kinds of commanders and a guy like Hitler. And he's kind of like he's caught between the, the hammer and the anvil in a lot of ways, but he successfully negotiates time and again real crises. But again, what's saving Army Group Center? Is it the whole order, a blanket solution to apply generically to the entire Eastern Front? Or is it actually what Klug is trying to practice, which is we've got to consider it on a case-by-case basis and we've got to be prepared to, in some cases, provide freedom of maneuver, which is off tracks tactic. We've got to empower our subordinates to make the right decision. And at the same time, we've got to make sure that they're not just reacting to very dangerous circumstances. If they can hold, they must hold. And that's a real another, I think, feature of the story. Yeah, I enjoyed that part of the book where he was uh, doing the ultimate balance act, you know, uh, of, of, you know, um, trying to adhere to authority, but at the same time, making sure his men don't die unnecessarily or get, or get wiped mm. out or whatever. But again, what's the point of having tanks and trucks and, uh, and mechanized infantry if they're not allowed to maneuver? I mean, it just, mm. but like you said, you have to be able to do that in order to survive. And you, you mentioned just a second ago, there's a lot about that, that we would not know if it wasn't for the, the, the research, the more thorough research and then just listening to, generals who wrote books after the war. So that that yeah, brings true. me to my next question. Um, so of the many aspects of your book that I enjoyed, one is the research, because I, I really I really enjoy that because you're always finding out something new with the latest book that comes out. But this book had, um, it was researched as a top-down narrative using archival records, but also, and you were making this point a second ago, mm. from a, a bottom-up perspective, using uh, dozens of soldiers' letters and diaries, uh, that kind of stuff. And I really enjoyed that because it made me feel like I was right in the middle of the fighting. I was reading your book on my front porch. It's a nice day. I'm in shorts. But I'm reading your book and I'm starting to feel cold because these guys are losing limbs to frostbite or they're dying, being dragged back on a sled back to the rear. But there's, you know, it's just so cold and they're, and they're not prepared. But with both types of research, um, what can we learn about the campaign from having that individual perspective? Oh, yeah, that's, a, I think, a really good question. I mean, you know, I can't speak for everybody who reads these kinds of books. I think people want to know the, the you know, what all the stuff we've been talking about. The, the, how do we understand this campaign at this sort of large level? We need to understand it that way. But the experience of the war is completely different, right? I mean, if we want to know how did it, what did it, what, did, what was it like to be in this kind of war? You, you really don't get that from the top-down sort of files. And yet, that's a that's the story that every one of us as individuals can relate to. Once we start reading a guy's, you know, heartfelt letter about. God, what he's been through, you suddenly connect with the story in a very different way. And I think the danger with doing a, a top-down narrative is it can start to feel, and some Eastern Front books really do feel this way, at least to me, and I say that as someone who really enjoys reading them, they can start to feel very dry. It's very one more report, one more directive, one other order that went out here. And this, is, right. and then, so what I try to do is, you know, I have this operational narrative, as I was saying, it sort of progresses through the armies for you know, every 10 days, but then I'd like to have a thematic discussion, a whole chapter in between that's going to look at a whole other aspect of this lived experience. So, you know, how do they survive on the Eastern Front? And that's not just, you know, what do they eat and, and, and where do they, and where does their ammunition come from? It's, it's, mm-hmm. it's psychological. What sort of coping mechanisms do they have that they can cope with this level of death and this level of suffering. And, and you know, it's it's all kinds of things. And I try to sort of list a whole lot of things that I would be looking for that you might just read past before I started all the research so that I would know, oh, they're talking about something. Like most of the war these guys actually spend in bunkers. 
It's so free. It's so cold out there. You're only outside when you're on sentry duty or or the Soviets are attacking. Otherwise, you're in a bunker and you're sitting there with your comrades. It gets dark early. They actually haven't got very good lighting in most of these places. They don't have enough candles. They don't have enough oil. So they can often sit in darkness. So what are they actually doing? So what are their conversations? What do they talk about? How do they how do they process the war? Do they talk about home? Do they talk about the war? What are they what are they doing there? Uh, How much humor do they use? What kind of humor is on the Eastern Front? How important is things like religion? How often do they pray? Um, You know, what sort of, you know, do they have a sex life there? You know, what what is going on in these places? If they're in villages, to what extent are they exploiting the population? How do they prepare food? What are they cooking? All of that stuff, I think, is very, very interesting. I mean, it it gives you a much better sense of of the lived experience of this, not just the Eastern Front, but specifically in the winter. And sometimes it's a very contrasting one, like maybe just to mention one or two um, examples. Mm -hmm. uh, I realized, oh, there's a whole Christmas celebration. There's also a whole New Year's celebration, and they're preparing for it. I mean, it's a big holidays, of course, and it's very interesting to look at, you know, you, you can't imagine this period is just crisis for the German army, but actually almost everywhere there's a, some kind of celebration, and some of them are really quite, you know, phenomenal. They really organize a whole big shindig and songs and, and, and entertainment and local people providing music and so on. Uh, and, and for New Year's, there's a whole apparently a lot long areas of the Eastern Front, there's firework displays. Uh, they, they load up their artillery with this stuff. They fire off flares. In some cases, they just send a whole barrage toward the Soviet Union. Um, and they're, they're, they're drinking a lot of alcohol. But then I was interested in, well, where's the alcohol coming from? And there's all these right. like local distilleries that they're setting up, and some of them you know, poisoning their guys, and, and some of it's captured vodka. Others are sending stuff out, had, had stuff sent by their high command from France, you know, and and you start to realize, well, this is not stuff that normally makes it into your Eastern Front narrative because there's so many more important things. But at the same time, sure. that lived experience is is kind of fascinating, you know. Um, so, yeah, letters and diaries are an essential part for me. I mean, all my books kind of do this, this contrast between top down, bottom up. And I think it's also for the reader beyond whatever their interests are, you, you find yourself in a, in a bigger book needing in some ways to break from whichever way in which a, a book like this is written. You know, it's nice to be able to switch between different um, perspectives. Absolutely. And and, uh, and I really do appreciate your time. I'm sure you're a busy guy, but I have one more question for you. Um, again, same with research, because again, I was watching one particular uh, – uh, interview you did it was on YouTube. I was absolutely fascinated by what you were talking about with your German research. But but I'll put the question this way. So again, zooming out a little bit, uh, in your experience, uh, how does Russian and German scholarship compare in the respective uh, representations about this massive war in the East? Yeah, well, I I think in some ways that's why there's still, and again, it rips off that very first point I was making. That's why there's still such uh, uh, ground to be covered for researchers working in this field. It's not because there hasn't been histories being written for 70 years, but, you know, you would imagine a war like this is predominantly being written where? It's being written in Russia or the Soviet Union, but we all know how ideologically tainted the Soviet accounts were. And while there was a period there in the 90s where Russia seemed to be free, we all now know that, well, Putin's Russia is a very different place. There are all kinds of, there's actually history laws now. You can go to prison for five years for writing the wrong kind of World War II history. Uh, so that's obviously not uh, in the interest of academic freedom. You also can't get as much access to the archives. You can imagine all the problems that has for really writing an objective history. And conversely, in Germany, there's those same phenomenon, that same phenomenon isn't there. But what's, what is there is there is a real disinterest in uh, operational military history. And in some ways, that's to be, to be understood. I mean, if you ask the question, well, what, did the Nazis, what sort of history did the Nazis teach in their universities? It was a lot of military history and obviously highly ideological, very patriotic, very, you know, not, not objective at all. And so you can imagine after the war, two things are in the minds of average Germans. One is, oh, God, we do not want to do military history now for a while. Second of all, the big question, well, and what's the point? Are we trying to figure out how to fight the next war better? Because after two wars, I think we're done. Um, so you can imagine this, this kind of unwillingness to engage. But interestingly, when I went there to study, um, you know, my professor said when I sort of pitched this idea, he said, it's 
good actually, David, that you're an Australian if you're going to go into a German university and try and do this kind of topic. And I remember thinking, well, I don't think that's a good thing at all. I'm, I'm trying to make up a lot of ground here. And, 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 and he just said to me, yeah, no, you don't really understand the political context. And after living there for 11 years, I realized he was 100% right. Um, <laughs> there was a natural suspicion about me because I was doing this what are you doing? Eastern Front World War II tanks? It's not to say Germans don't engage with their Nazi past. That would be incorrect. They do an enormous amount. In fact, they're not sweeping it under the rug. They're engaging what? With the, the criminality of the, the Nazi regime. They deal with a lot of that stuff. They talk about the Holocaust. And when they engage with the Wehrmacht, it's about the war of annihilation, the criminality. The problem is that too many of them are still thinking, well, operations is is a distraction from what we really should be talking about. And I think in my time there, I was able to convince a lot of people, well, the people I was talking to who were perhaps a bit suspicious, maybe even a lot suspicious at the beginning, that one can make the point, listen, guys, your area is important. I learn by reading your sort of stuff. I get all kinds of insights into the operations. There is absolutely no question you can also learn from the operations. Why? Because if one of the accepted narratives within the war of annihilation and Holocaust literature is the radicalization of Nazi policy is linked to the progress of the war. In other words, Nazi policy becomes more radical as the war goes on. So doesn't it make sense to study the war itself? In other words, operations can help you chart what you want to understand about the war in the same way that the War of Annihilation produces an enormous amount of really good literature on the makeup and social composition, the way in which these guys are processing information, the extent to which ideology is a factor in their thinking. And then that helps me to understand, okay, in the military space, I can apply this in different ways because I have expertise in other areas, but it's helpful. Right. Um, in the same way, I don't want to limit my histories by not looking at top down or bottom up. I want to look at both. Uh, I don't think there's any one way you can engage and we certainly shouldn't be saying, hey, look, uh, uh, only this kind of history is useful. No, it's all useful. We just need to get past that idea that, you know, and I think this is what's in their minds, even if they don't say it. If you're a military historian that says something about your politics, you must be somehow right wing and pro military. And that's mm -hmm. a problem for us. And, and, and that doesn't say anything about my politics. It just says I'm interested in understanding this and I want to access any information and we need to discuss it, even if you're only only interest is the Holocaust. Again, if there's a relationship between the radicalization of the Nazi policy and the progress of the war, then what did I say about Barbarossa? It's not going so well. So that might be a big key, in fact, to they won't go on and try and advertise my stuff. But some of the Holocaust historians, Alex JK has written an article saying, look, Stahl charts a very different course in uh, 1941 and says, look how bad the operations are progressing. Isn't it interesting that the Holocaust in the East begins as early as July? To what extent might operational factors have influenced decision making around the genocide? And that's him drawing these conclusions, not me drawing those conclusions, but I would say, yes, there are real problems. And again, that's reflected in this the, the war diaries. It's not me making it up. Someone's reading these war diaries at that time, and, and, and there are clearly real – I mean, they lose uh, 63,000 men in July. That's already phenomenal yeah. losses. That's actually killed – for the Germans. That's a large number of men to be losing if this is your successful phase. And they're not ending the war. Anyway, I won't go on at long length, but um, <laughs> bottom line, there's problems with Russian and German historiography, which leaves a lot for Anglo-Americans to engage with this war. You need obviously languages, but it means there's a huge amount of topics and there's nowhere near as much historiography that's been uh, done uh, in this 75 year period. So there's a lot still to be done, which is good news for younger academics <laughs> and older academics. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and like you, the point that you were making, you know, between the operational research and all the other research, it is all connected and it should be viewed as, uh, you know, all the sums of um, something much larger because mm -hmm. that's how life is lived. That's how wars are waged. And, and you're absolutely right. Um, Dr. Stahill, thank you very much for this book. Thank you very much for your time. And for all my listeners, it's Retreat from Moscow, A New History of Germany's Winter Campaign, 1941 to 1942. Dr. Stahill, thank you very much, sir. Thank you for the platform. It's really been a pleasure. Stigmas around mental health were designed to hold us down, but we don't have to let them. If you're struggling, text or call 988 to connect with a trained crisis counselor who won't judge, just listen. 988 Suicide and Crisis Lifeline. Hope has a new number.